Since I spend so much time in the kitchen and so many of my videos are about the food ways of Appalachia, I've been sharing some of my favorite things in the kitchen, in my kitchen. I already have one video, the part one, and I will link to that so you can check it out if you missed it, and this will be part two. And today I'm just talking about cast iron. I grew up in a family who used cast iron as cookware every day. Granny and Pap, when they were first married, someone gifted them with a a set of cast iron pans. They, they didn't have no brand on the back of them. They weren't Griswold or Wagner or anything like that. But they had the biggest one all the way down to the little baby one that I always liked. And I always thought of them as a family because they nested inside of each other, you know. But Granny and Pap used them often. I learned how to cook in them. So it was just kind of part of my life growing up. Matt loved cast iron too. So when we were married, it was just natural that that's what we, we preferred to cook on and that's what we would kind of gather our favorite pans over the years. So my very favorite cast iron pan is a Griswold. And it just has such a great feel to it. And I use this to do my cornbread in. I fry eggs in it, uh, pancakes. Um, I kind of keep it separate from the others just because it has such a great finish from cooking cornbread in it for so many years. Cornbread is great for cast iron for helping that seasoning. And several years ago, probably 15 or something like that, Miss Cindy, Matt's mother, for Christmas that year, she decided she was gonna get Matt some really old pieces of cast iron because she knew how much we loved it. So this is one of the ones that she bought and I dearly treasure it. It's my favorite pan in the whole house. One of the ones that uh, I was talking about Granny and Pap when they got married, how they had, you know, someone gifted them with that whole nest and set. Of course, in those days, cast iron was more popular probably than it is today. But in the same way, someone gifted me and Matt with this. This is a lodge, a great old big lodge, when we were first married. And I use it anytime I'm gonna fry hamburgers or something that takes up a lot of room. So it's one that I use a lot and I like it. It's way heavier, of course. A lot of people, say they have trouble with cast iron because it's heavy, because of the heaviness of it. Um, it those older ones like Griswold, they're very expensive but because they're old, but they are much lighter. They have, they're they made from a different, I'm sure you know more about that than I do, made from a different type of cast iron, I guess, or a different method of making it. But this lodge one gets a lot of use too. Now, since I've been on YouTube, I've had some, I just have the best subscribers ever. Uh, people that leave the comments, all you gotta do is read through the comment section and you'll see how wonderful uh, the people that watch our videos are. You add more uh, knowledge and information and meaning than I do in the video. So I'm very grateful to all of you. But a few people have sent me stuff and some of it has, has been cast iron. A dear friend named Turtle that we actually got to meet sent us several pieces. He's somebody that deals in those old cast iron pieces. Uh, and we so appreciate him and we're so, we're so excited. So he sent, here's one of those wonderful Griswolds. Um, he sent more than one of them, but isn't that wonderful? So it's just a great all around pan. And again, it's not near as heavy as the others. He also sent this one, the skillet, kind of a flat. I love to use it to put biscuits on. He actually sent this to Katie, but I, but I use it. Uh, so it's a very nice one too. I love those and it has that same great feel. Gris Griswold would probably be my favorite even though um, they are old and hard to find and then often expensive. Another Griswold that I have, this is a number six. This one come from Matt's mother, Miss, Cin Miss Cindy, back when she was buying those. And it's got a really good feel. And since it's kind of a smaller size, it gets used a whole lot. This little one, still not as little as the little baby one that I remember from Pap and Granny's house, but they did have one this size too as the pieces went up. And it's not marked on the bottom. It says it's a number five. There's for you that know about cast iron, there's kind of a little little raised square and two little light dashes under it. Maybe that's supposed to be an 11. That's what it looks like. But it's very old. It was Matt's grandmother's, Bonnie. It was Miss great-grandmother's, I mean, sorry, grandmother's, Miss Cindy's mother, um, Bonnie. So when she passed away, we got some of her pots and pans, and this was one of the pans that we got. And it has a really good feel to it, too. Those old ones just, just have a, a wonderful feel. Plus, you just love thinking about all the things that um, have been cooked in them over the years. That history is really meaningful to me. 
This is another one that we use a lot, uh, and it's a, a Wagner, Wagner wear, and it's one of those, again, that Miss Cindy gifted Matt with that Christmas when she was in the, in the hunt for buying the old cast iron. This is one of the, one of the pieces that she sent. Now, uh, we have Dutch ovens that we use, too. We have a lodge. I can't really remember for sure where we got that. It may, Corey picked up, I think Corey got it at a yard sale for Matt. Anytime the girls are out yard sales or thrift stores and they see something and they know that we would like it, they always call Matt to see, see his opinion, and I think that's where that one come from. But this one right here is a very special one. So it has, it says it's Wagner wire, the lid does, very you can see and we use this a lot Matt especially uses it he loves to do stews and roasts and different things in that in it but the bottom doesn't have it just has an eight that's all but the story behind it is what's so wonderful it still has the thing that you could hang it over the fire so there was a gentleman that I met Charles Fletcher I met him through the blind pig and the acorn my blog and he just lived an amazing life. He lived in the times, you know, before uh, when people were still riding horses. He was older than Pap, uh, who was born in 1937. I wish I could remember exactly when Charles was born, but I, I can't. But so he lived prior to, to all that. Then he actually lived, he worked like during the um, CC camps here in my area uh, during the wartime. And then he eventually was drafted. He served in World War II. Um, so, and then he come back and then he went to electrical school. He just had an amazing life. He had experienced so many different areas of, of kind of, as you look back through history, all these major impacts, he had experienced them. But he grew up in Canton, North Carolina, in the thickety section of Canton, North Carolina, and he just had wonderful stories about those times. And when his wife passed away, he decided, because he was lonely and, and sad and all that, that to help with his grief, that he would begin to write down all those stories. So he wrote a lot, several books, um, and they were just great. Very heartwarming, uh, kind of humorous. He had a good sense of humor, stories about growing up in the mountains of Western North Carolina. But through the blind pig and the acorn, I met him and we become friends. And so one time, uh, he lived at that time in Cleveland, Tennessee. Uh, once he left Canton, he lived in Cleveland for the rest of his life. And he worked at the Bowwater plant there. So one day, me and Pap went and spent the day with him to visit. And he told us all kinds of stories, and, and we really enjoyed talking to him. And in fact, after that, he would call and talk to Pap and Granny on the phone often, and, and they become friends with him. So he was just a dear person. But when we got ready to leave that day, he showed me there in his, in his living room. He had like a fireplace brick, kind of, and he had some pans and different things sitting on it. And this one was sitting on it. And he said he wanted me to have it, but he wanted to tell me the story about it first. So back in 1954, when he was he was beginning, he was working at Bowwater down there, and they were doing an expansion or doing something to, they were doing grading work anyway down along the river, and he just walked down there to see what was going on, to kind of watch it. And as he was watching them move, uh, the equipment move dirt, he seen them uncover something, you know, the blade kind of uncover something. And he got their attention and, and made them wait, and he went over there, and this is what he found. It was this. So he took it and had it, it was of course all rusted and you know covered in dirt, it'd been buried, no telling how long. And he took it and got it sandblasted there at the plant and then worked on refinishing it and then took it home and was proud of it and, and set it there. And, and then of course when people would come over, they would talk about it. So there was a lady, one, a friend of him and his wife's that would come over and when she seen it, she asked about it and he told her how he found it. And, and she said, well, you know, you really ought to give it to me. And she said, I got two reasons why. And one of the reasons was her mother had lived down there along the river. So she said, it kind of is connected to me. And the other reason is I have a lid that I bet you would fit it perfectly, but I don't have the, the bottom, you know. And he said over the years, she would tease him, you know, when are you going to give me that? When are you going to give me that? And he'd always tell her, no, he wasn't going to give it up. And he said it just become kind of a, a joke between them, you know. But eventually what the, the kind lady did, she brought him the lid. And this was the lid and give it to him. And it did fit it perfectly. So uh, just has such a great story behind it. Thinking about Charles standing there watching them doze out there on the river and them turning this over. And, and one of the reasons he wanted to hang on to it was because 
Um, of course, people in this area and other people are very familiar with the heartbreak of the Cherokee Trail of Tears. But as that happened, that was that location there by the river, there was a location where they camped, like on their way on the Trail of Tears, which was such a sad, horrible thing. But he always wondered, could it have been like left in haste? You know, was it, did it date back that far? Did it wash down the river? You know, there was all this just mysterious things, stories, as, as with lots of history that we don't know what the, what the truth of it is. Um, he just always wondered, you know, did somebody, why would it, because in those days it would have been so valuable. Why did somebody leave it? You know, it was so old. Uh, of course, it's valuable to me today. I wouldn't want to leave it anywhere. Anyway, so that one just has a great story, and we love to use it. And Charles is gone now, but I think he would be glad to know that uh, me and Matt still enjoy cooking in that pot that he saved so long ago. And I'll share one more with you. This is a great one, too. This one was Matt's uh, grandmother, Bonnie's. Has a great lid. It's a... It's not really, it is a Dutch oven, but not one with like the one that, from Charles. It's more of a deep, and it just says number eight on the bottom, so there's no, but when you need a deep, a deep pan, it, it works really well, and we really love it because, again, the history of his grandmother having it. So often people notice, oh, one more I wanted to tell you. This is a new piece. This is also one that was sent by a wonderful subscriber. It's a lodge, a griddle, and we've used it and we love it, but I'm anxious to use it even more. Uh, I need to get in the habit of using it and need to, to learn more about it. As with any kind of cooking thing, it takes you a while to really break in, but I'm so appreciative of that one too. Um, and we really, Matt and I both really enjoy it. But often when I... I cook with cast iron so people see it in my videos they want to know well how do you season it and how do you how do you take care of it well uh, as far as t how to keep that season on it I think the more you use cast iron the better it gets you have to really use it and the more you use it the, the just the better it gets to me now as far as seasoning it and taking care of it Cowboy Kent Rollins has wonderful videos, and he does his much the same way we do, and so you can check out his videos about how to how to season it, and he also has several videos about kind of the, there's some new cast iron, uh, Field Company is one of them, and I can't think of the think of the other ones, but there's several kind of newer ones that are kind of making cast iron in that old way, and he talks about them and talks about the differences in them. And so he just has some wonderful videos if you want to check his out. Maybe someday I'll do a video about, about uh, seasoning them. But until then, please check him out. And as far as taking care of it, when we, like my cornbread pan, when I cook cornbread in it, most of the time you just need to wipe it out and that's good because something like that, you know. But if it um, doesn't leave a, a big mess or anything, might leave a little bit of cornmeal. But if you do have something that's really messy, we like to pour just a little bit of water in it in the bottom of the pan and, and heat it, heat that water as you gently scrape with a wooden, you know, wooden utensil and, and to loosen up all the little bits. It will really loosen them fast and then rinse it out and then wipe it out. And we kind of keep a, we have like a little, just an old container here and we keep a, an old towel in there that has olive oil on it and then we might give it a swirl in the bottom after it dries um, and we can and once it since you've already got it on heat when you're doing that if you kind of leave it dry wipe it out and dry and then kind of set it back on that heat and then do the towel in there then that heat kind of helps absorb the oil and you've made sure that it's dried out and it's not going to rust by putting it back in the cabinet or anything like that so cast iron is um a lot of people have difficulty with it, but I think if you give it a chance, you'll be like me and you'll really enjoy it. But one of the downsides is, especially if, if you have a hard time holding on to stuff, is it is heavy. So that's, that's probably the biggest detriment to it um, that I can think of. Another question that we often get is how in the world do we use cast iron on our glass top stove? Well, truthfully, that stove is probably, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years old. And when we first got it, while well, we didn't even, we didn't read the directions, we didn't even think about it, you not being able to use cast iron on it. We just, you know, we've just always used cast iron. Uh, and I truthfully didn't know that till that we'd had the stove for years. And then I heard someone say, well, you're not supposed to uh, can on it and you're not supposed to use cast iron. And I thought, well, Granny does all her canning on hers and she uses cast iron and I use cast iron. and 
Uh, I'm not saying you should because it might yours might break, but I'm just saying that's why we do and we've never had an issue with it. Of course, we're not taking our pans over there and slamming them down. We're very careful, uh, just like we would be though on any kind of stove. So, um, but that's the reason we use cast iron on our glass top. We've never had a problem and uh, so we just we didn't know any better in the beginning, but then once we didn't have a problem, we just continued to use it. So I hope you enjoyed learning more about uh, some of the favorite things in my kitchen, which is definitely the cast iron that we cook with uh, on a daily basis, pretty much. And if you have, you know, maybe you have some special cast iron pieces. If you do, I would love to hear about them. I know I've, I've read in the comments, a lot of people will say they had their grandmother's cast iron frying pan uh, or their mother's or their aunt's or uncle's or something like that. And they treasure it just like I treasure these pieces. Just like everything else in my kitchen, pretty much every piece that I use has a story behind it, <laughs> which is kind Kind of as a sentimental person and and a person who likes meaningful things that that's just how i like it and that's how i live my life so please drop back by next time to see what else my favorite things in the kitchen because i've got so much stuff i know i'm going to at least do a part three and maybe even more than that